absolute devastation to liberation, 20-year relationship destroyed by cheating wife. My ex-girlfriend and I were high school sweethearts at the end of her senior year, I'm 40 years old and she's 39. I had recently finished college when I ran into her at a video store in a nearby suburb. We became close friends for about 6 months before I mustered the nerve to kiss her. The rest, as they say, is history. Since this sad tale has made its way to the submarine, we can assume the worst. I had never experienced the trauma that was coming because I had never had friends who cheated and had never heard anyone talk about it. Finding out about it happened by chance. My ex-spouse ditched me and my parents to attend a wedding in another state for a co-worker. About two weeks before, she had filled me in on what had happened. I realized I'd lost my phone during the day while watching a movie with my parents, and it turned out that my ex had a few friends we didn't know each other through. While watching the film, I was browsing the web on my iPad and only lukewarmly switched over to using the Find My iPhone function. After 10 years of marriage, my wife and I shared many services, including iTunes. The order of the phones was switched, with hers coming up ahead of mine. She wasn't out of the country, but rather staying at a popular hotel brewery in a nearby city. It's a popular venue for weddings, so I figured she and her co-workers would be there. In the evening, specifically 8 o'clock after 2 hours of searching the hotel with the GPS set to a specific wing, I gave up and went home. When she wasn't to be found at any of the local eateries, I improvised an Eddie Murphy routine. That's what I call it when you lie, cheat, or steal to get what you want, like Eddie did in every one of his earliest films. I walk up to the front desk and ask for the room number, saying something like, gee, my sister was at that wedding earlier, and I'm afraid some guy took advantage of her because she's drunk. After some hesitation and a request for my phone number, they eventually showed me the way in. As I rounded the next few corners, my heart was racing in anticipation of what I knew I would find. After another failed attempt to channel Eddie, I knocked on the door. Room service? I tried to sound as nice as possible while secretly fuming inside. I must be in the wrong room, a male voice replied. My secret was instantly betrayed, it seems like I have the right F, ing room. Let's have a chat if you'd just be honest. Finally caught, my cheating spouse begins texting me. She says they'll have to talk in the morning and she won't leave the room until then. Oh, stay the night with your amour, got it. The restrooms here are located in the hallways, European style, so I waited around for an hour to see if anyone would come out. For the sake of proof, I went and took pictures of her car, and then I went home and cried myself to sleep. She suggested that we meet in a park where there would be lots of people, and I agreed. That is what she actually declared. I haven't hit you in 20 years or even yelled at you angrily, but now we have to worry about domestic violence. After keeping her waiting, I finally reached the park, only to realize that my initial estimations were still too low. I was prepared to make this work, to fix it, despite getting the cold shoulder the night before. My wife and I have been married for 10 to 11 years, so I came with an open mind and an expectation of regret. She apologizes profusely, and her sobs reveal that she really just feels bad that she was discovered. How I learned it made her snicker when I told her. She said something to the effect of I just can't go back to the way things were, I'm so trapped there, when we talked about her returning home, and it shocked and fascinated me. 3. Oh, I see, she's the one who got hurt, right? She stayed at a downtown hotel for three nights, presumably with her lover, debating whether or not to return home. The AP was also in a relationship and is the mother to a 12-year-old son. Perhaps the responsibilities of her personal life became too much for her to handle. She returned to her residence. We slept in separate bedrooms for a week, and she was completely uninterested in me during that time. She says she'll get to it, but she needs some time alone to process everything that's happened. She no longer wishes to consult the AP. We're doing what's supposed to be done and starting marriage counseling. The first meeting goes by with no new information being revealed, I have asked for complete transparency and have been researching current events online like a madman. She simply states that she cannot return to our former lifestyle, without providing any explanation for why she feels this way or what she sees as elking in our previous situation. Thankfully, the therapist makes a profound observation, you've ended the affair, 
right? Awe and shocking. The answer is no, she hadn't. I was planning on calling him to let him know, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. As I started to troll slowly into the trickle truth, she admitted that they had been together for a while, saying that it had been at least a year. This was something I had no idea about at all. The bedroom bliss persists, and she uses gifts to influence me. I was given a watch with the inscription loving you more with each passing second. When she was out of town for work or a romantic interlude, she always made sure to call or text me. By the end, I'm a sobbing mess who can't decide whether to end her marriage for good or run away from the situation altogether. In every fiber of my being, I love this woman. Second session, transparency is abysmal. In fact, my wife has disabled location sharing on all of her devices and changed her passwords. How dare I request such a thing when she is broken and grieving. X claims that if they can just have an open relationship with you, everything will be fine. And yet, in my desperation and terrible mental state, I have to admit that I agree with her. I think intellectually I know it's over, but I can't seem to convince my body of that. The therapist presses the issue, telling her that she needs to end things with the AP about whom she has heard nothing and that polyamory may not be healthy for her right now. My ex claims her therapist was mean to her and therefore she will never return. Oh, I see, I can feel a pattern forming. Every night, I cry terrible, heartbreaking tears. This woman, with whom I once shared the deepest intimacy, has suddenly turned her back on me. Like apparitions of our former selves, we walk right by each other as we go about the house. It's the darkest time in my life, and I occasionally lose my temper and yell and scream at the world. We engage in what must be makeup as time, but when we're done, she claims that she needed to get off and that they never loved each other. Ouch. Oh, okay, here I was thinking we were in a wonderful, ever-sparkling relationship because we were always physically intimate two four times per week. I take action, it could turn out to be a mistake. I sign up for Tinder and have a few fun dates. I'm not shy about letting people know I'm married and on the verge of a divorce. Before we even met, I was completely open and honest. One of them said that I was a great guy and that I should call her as soon as I finished the divorce. The other one put me up in her apartment. I now regret not waiting, as my ex is ammunition and some justification for the affair. I'm almost done with the wild ride, so hang tight and we'll get there in a second. That very same weekend, she goes on an open camping trip with her AP and, in the interest of full disclosure, she tells me about it. Meanwhile, that doesn't prove my other questions. As a result of this setup, I maintained my low self-esteem and slept with the Tinder crush. Monday comes and I've had enough, but surprisingly I'm still willing to work through it and repair the marriage that isn't there. WS leaves for a business trip, and at this point I have absolutely no idea what is going on and zero trust in him. Before she gets home, I give her a call and tell her, you leave this man, you commit to loving me, you rebuild this trust immediately, or I'm leaving. As an explanation, she said she wasn't confident in her ability to do everything listed. It's a disaster that requires a cleanup crew, not a marriage. The dog and I pack up our belongings and head to a friend's house while she's away. She was shocked when I told her I was moving out, she had not expected me to follow through. Experiment in insanity, to say the least. After nearly two months of dealing with this, I warned her that she needed to make a choice quickly. There came a point where I could no longer tolerate living with her, and that point is rapidly approaching. The likelihood of a divorce being finalized in the next two months was high, I told her. She had done nothing to win me over, and all she had done was insult me out of her own selfishness and an insatiable desire for male approval. As a response, she blamed me for uncovering the affair. She claimed that she was content staying at home with us and would have continued to play the role of good wife for the rest of their lives if I hadn't discovered the truth. What I heard on the phone sickened me to the point of near insanity. Where had I heard their name before? With whom I spent the majority of my waking hours? Who cared so little about me that I was merely a disposable item, or at best a means to satisfy her whims? Retracting her steps, she exclaimed, the two of us might develop into something more meaningful thanks to this, and we might even enjoy going on dates and looking forward to reuniting in the future. We'll get back together if it's meant to be. What the heck is going on here, man? 
I was getting nothing but a horrible shell of a human from this person, and even in my broken state I knew that love is a practice and that relationships take work. I made another attempt to meet with her about a week later, she wanted to talk about the divorce. In the end, all she wanted to do was flirt with me and then steer the conversation. She'd tell me she loved me, then push me away if I reached out for her leg. She had done the insane thing of moving out since I had, getting a nice city apartment just a couple blocks from the bar we happened to be at, and paying double rent. I offered to walk her to her new place, but she scoffed and said she'd be fine on her own. It's fine, I guess, I've been your husband for almost 11 years, and we've been together for 20, but now I can't even touch your leg or walk you home. I cried harder than I ever had before that night, alone with the dog in my new rented room at a friend's house. In this case, it wasn't about what I wanted or needed, but rather that I knew it was over. The woman I loved was gone, and while the rose-colored glasses may have been off, I realized it was in my best interest to cut this person out of my life permanently. I felt like a complete failure because I had loved this person with all my heart for many years and had always assumed that my feelings were returned. My therapist and many of you have told me that I was the lobster in the pot. For some reason, I ignored the warning signs that she had a problem with my friends or that her friends didn't like me. When she would bring me in close and show me off like a trophy, I didn't think twice about it because oh okay, I'm kind of fit and handsome. When she started constantly disappearing for work, I didn't think twice about it. When I asked her how she felt and if there was anything that could improve our relationship, I didn't see any either. A part of it was the love in her eyes, but I can also see now that she was manipulating me in nasty ways. For her, it seemed like there was always something missing. Nothing I did at work, in our home, or on the house counted. It was an elaborate hoax that served my codependency perfectly. She was skilled at creating just enough chaos and enticement to keep me interested in mending things and improving myself to the point where I felt I was good enough. I didn't need her to love me back my love would be enough for us both. After giving it some thought, I decided that the divorce was happening, and that, given her bizarre demeanor, I would be the one to file the necessary paperwork. You've only seen the awakening thus far, the claws are about to come out. I wish I could end this mega rant here. It had been three weeks since we last spoke, and in that time I had come to terms with my life choices. Friends have encircled me, and now I'm making progress and getting some answers. I see now what a trap it was, and I've decided for sure that we won't be getting back together. Ring. Ring. What the heck, I wonder who that is. It's me, W.S., we were supposed to have coffee and talk about all the divorce paperwork and how to make it less complicated. She says that she will be late and that the best time to reach her is two hours after our original meeting time. Fine. So I do the same, jumping through more hoops, and then she texts me that she's at the nearby family mountain cabin and that I should come up for the week and stay with her. Oh, fine, I'll just throw away what little honor I have left and go back to the bedroom. Oh, no way. Do not send us. After explaining why it was more important for me to focus on getting through the divorce, I politely decline the invitation. She becomes flustered and, oddly enough, angry, when I don't immediately come running up to the cabin. When I inquired further about the AP, she told me that he had ended their relationship as soon as I left the picture. Sometimes I feel like karma is a capricious creature. During our long-awaited coffee date, I brought all the necessary paperwork and she lavished me with compliments on how well I appear to be doing. Oh no, I'm freaking devastated, and this isn't a game to me, lady. We discussed the terms of our property division, in which she claims to be entitled to more than half of the house and in which I agree not to touch her 401k in exchange for her letting me keep the business I've worked so hard to build over the past decade. I plan to continue using her health care plan throughout the divorce, and we'll get this matter settled as soon as possible. And as I turn to leave, she comes after me and follows me to my car, muttering something. Turning on my heel, I inquire if she has anything to contribute. I'm desperately looking for an expression of regret, some remnant of the person I once believed loved me. In a question-like expression, it blurts out, I'm so. I'm sorry, to what end? So, I respond, I'm sorry for what I did, and that's why I'm saying this, for. The words sounded like they were spoken by the quietest mouse in Zootopia's largest church. It was a nice try, 
but it stank of surprise at being caught rather than contrition. This was useful because it confirmed my suspicions and clarified my position. She wasn't sad because of anything she did, but because her cover was blown and she couldn't have the man who would do anything for her anymore. That would be the last time anyone apologized to me. She pauses for me to figure out what she means by asking about our story's trajectory. I mean, seriously, what are we supposed to tell people? Is our story that we mutually decided to see other people, or that something else happened, or what? Oh, right, holy cow. You can make up whatever you like about our story, but I'm telling the truth to anyone who will listen. You did it to me, you walked out on our wedding, and now you want your cake. I don't need to make up a backstory just to make myself feel better anymore, I've had enough. Okay, bye E. As I cross the street to leave, a train comes and abruptly ends our conversation. Upon learning of the divorce, I text her entire family to explain what happened. Claws like a wolverine, that's right. Knowing there was no good way to make up and that the relationship wasn't healthy to begin with, I was relieved to close the door several more devastating events occurred to me as my divorce was progressing a full blast from a double-barreled shotgun struck me my wife and I had a flood on Super Bowl Sunday three months before D-Day while she was away on one of her business or S-time trips when I returned from visiting a friend, I discovered half a foot of water in our garage when I called to tell her about the disaster, it sounded like she was right next door, even though she was ostensibly in Amsterdam where some field offices were located in either case, she starts yelling at me to fix it, so I do I should have hurried to Home Depot in the store's closing minutes to pick up a sump pump to clear the driveway of water fortunately. Our garage was the lowest point of the property and connected to a finished basement but water has completely flooded the garage and is dangerously close to surmounting the threshold leading inside I reach out to a pal who is both a landscape architect and a general handyman even though we work until midnight to fill sandbags, we're being thwarted by the heaviest rainfall in recorded history we managed to hold off the water for a short while, but the property is about to be submerged again due to the year's unprecedented rainfall totals we devise a plan to divert the water from the driveway into the utility room in my basement, where there is a drain to bring the water over, we use garden hoses that are 60 feet in length, and I pull on them using my lungs indeed, it does the trick. A steady stream of groundwater, measured in gallons per minute, also flows down my throat and into the drain even though the driveway continues to fill, it no longer floods I was able to use the time to bail water from around the house that was up to my calf using a shop vac, hauling up about 5 gallons at a time the water from one of our leaking gutters is not making it to the French drain, but rather the driveway after 3 hours of filling, a large trash can will overflow with rainwater unless I empty it I've been awake for 24 hours and drenched in rain and water to ensure that nothing bad happens while I'm sleeping, I set an alarm to wake up and evacuate the following morning, I rush to Home Depot to pick up an electric pump, and it ends up being the thing that saves the day. It only takes about 3 hours for this tiny $50 or less pump to completely relocate the driveway down the street to run off yes, there was a calf to knee deep pool of nearly 9,000 gallons of it in my driveway that very day, I go to work and complain to my landlord, who owns a building company to remove the moisture from the drywall in the building, he immediately contacts his disaster team which dispatches free industrial dehumidifiers to the residents when my WS gets home from work. The pump has been running in the driveway for a few days she begins to tell me that I shouldn't have told her until she got back from work because I was causing her unnecessary stress first she tells me that the pump in the driveway is like so embarrassing and that if I don't move it, she will oh okay, thought you'd want to know about the possibility of losing the house and almost causing $40,000 in potential damages it's important to note that the rain hasn't stopped the house is still being threatened by flooding. And my neighbors have offered assistance when I get home from an early morning appointment, I find that the pump has been relocated to the garage WTF? Rain stops falling long enough for me to fix the gutters, and the water level goes down. The following week, I suddenly become ill with a terrible flu that won't go away. Every spring on Saturdays, I begin the day by watching movies and relaxing. Around 2 p.m., Despite taking over the counter pain relievers, my chest pain returns with a vengeance. My WS and I have been discussing the situation as I feel it is becoming more critical. Why don't you try to look after yourself? If you need to go to the emergency room, I'll come along, but I won't be driving. Thanks so much for offering to accompany me to the hospital. 
but I'll get there on my own. The emergency room is where I end up, so I check in there. My oxygen levels have dropped slightly, but nobody seems worried about it when I arrive. It's been over three hours now, and the waiting has made my chest hurt to the point where I have trouble breathing. I stagger up to the front desk, almost falling over, because my ex won't even ask anyone to see me. I'm supposed to be wheeled away in a wheelchair, they say. Somebody shows up and takes more vitals, but they still don't solve the underlying issue. My chest hurts and I have trouble breathing, so I say I suspect I have pneumonia. They downplay the severity of the situation, saying probably not, and transferring me to a stretcher in an empty room. After another hour of waiting, I am completely befuddled and can hardly keep my airway open. My ex's only response has been to stare at me with cold, pleading eyes. To the dismay of the woman around me, I start shouting help. Someone help me. Over and over. It makes no difference to me. A sense of imminent death has overtaken me. There is no hope for me. After three to five minutes of my shouting, someone finally comes in angry at me but agrees to check me out. It seems that my blood is nearly septic and my oxygen levels have dropped to around 50%, both of which are potentially fatal. After saving the house, I drank some of the groundwater that was in my mouth and now I have bacterial pneumonia, there was never an expression of gratitude from her. She implied she was entitled to more than half the home and suggested she take it all. I was given a morphine drip after having numerous four fluids inserted to alleviate the severe chest pains. As I drift in and out of sleep, I find solace in catching her gaze as I come fully awake. With eyes that wish I had died instantly, this soulless human stares back at me. We have multi-million dollar life insurance policies that would be a great help to this woman. I finally saw the big warning sign at that point. Even though I caught her by accident, I immediately began making notes about what she said and who she claimed to be with. I knew deep down that something wasn't right because the numbers didn't add up. The fact that the stress of my divorce and the antibiotics I would take eventually wiped out my gut bacteria was the icing on the cake. Throughout the following year, I would learn that I have an overgrowth of bacteria and my small intestine SIBO. Let's get back to the pending divorce for a moment. This history, in addition to the preceding discussions, is crucial in setting the stage for what will occur in the story. I will list them briefly here to provide some background. My ex-girlfriend set a few things in motion after our meeting, during which I received the most feeble apology in the annals of human communication, and I informed her family about the affair. At first, she made it known to her friends and family that I was a deadbeat who was not putting anything into our relationship. She claimed she always wanted children, while I never did, and that she was afraid of me because I was almost abusive. This is why I continue to try to explain the situation to those who won't listen, or else I stop associating with them. Of course, the reality is quite the opposite. She insisted for decades that she had no interest in having children, and any time I brought the topic up, we got into a huge argument. Of course, her relatives sided with her, and I've lost touch with people I considered family over the past two decades. Actually, we just completely cut off all communication. Fortunately, the majority of our true friends abandoned her once they saw what she was doing. My ex-wife, upon learning of my gut bacteria and medical issues, called to say that she thought we should be friends and that she would see to it that I remained on our insurance through her workplace. After realizing that she was trying to reignite feelings, I politely declined her request for a second meeting. After we finished talking, she immediately began falsifying paperwork and submitted a letter of legal separation to human resources, thereby removing me from health coverage. Several urgent care visits and subsequent doctor's visits revealed quickly that my insurance was flawed. When I called, all they told me was that my policy had been cancelled. I tried to get Cobra insurance and was willing to pay the $800 per month for it, but they were unable to set it up. When I called my ex, she would complain that she had no idea what was going on, and it was a nightmare having to pay for everything out of pocket and constantly have to explain things to me. In the end, I spoke with the right person at HR, who informed me that they were unable to set up Cobra because they needed to locate the judge who signed my ex's legal separation documents. Dismayed and shocked, I demanded clarification on what they meant. 
My soon-to-be ex-spouse had me removed from health insurance coverage before our divorce was final by submitting a forged court document to HR with a fake name and signature in place of the judge's credentials. Because we had never been to court as a couple or filed any sort of legal document of separation, I exclaimed that they would never find the judge and that what they were holding was fraudulent. OMG! Human resources went into a state of panic like you've never seen and reinstated my insurance for the time I was out of the office. That's also why I was D-need Cobra coverage, the insurance company claimed they needed a judge's ruling to proceed. I texted my ex-girlfriend angrily, telling her she needed to contact HR immediately, but she played dumb, saying, well, we're separated, I just don't want to do anything illegal. This woman was full of baloney, she'd pretend to offer assistance after the fact by meeting with me a week later and handing me Cobra documents in my lawyer's office. The home was purchased by a new family thanks to her efforts. Wow, she really did well. Except she betrayed me and sold it to someone else. She had me put my signature on everything without ever telling me the total. My lawyer and the discovery process were the only sources of information. That stung, too. She threatened to destroy my company until I threatened to steal her 401k. Having the benefit of hindsight, I now wish I had. We joked that I would pay for all the groceries because she was saving for our future together in her retirement fund. Being self-employed meant that my retirement savings efforts were not matched by my employer, so unlike hers, mine did not grow into a sizable nest egg. She was prepared to completely destroy my company as well, but luckily for me, she was too cheap to hire a lawyer, so I was able to shield my assets and assure her that any judge would uphold my request to keep my business and steal her 401k. She still tells people I didn't want kids even though I have one and it breaks my mom's heart because she knows the truth. She got pregnant with the AP's kid as if to prove her ridiculous story. The two of them are still together despite her assurances to me that they had broken up when we did. Apparently, she waited around six months before introducing her new boyfriend to her loved ones. Performing improv comedy is a side gig for MD but seriously, he has a day job, and they actually met because of her job lol. One of his Facebook cyberstalking friends told me everything and was so sweet about it, apologizing and saying they are both disgusting people. Two years later, in April of this year, I noticed some strange charges from the IRS totaling $12,000. Incredulous at the results, I contact my bank and accountant. My recently deceased ex-wife used my bank account to settle her tax debt. Oopsies. I'm giving her until tomorrow at midnight to return the money, or I'll file a chargeback for fraud. I now wish I had let the IRS fine her to oblivion for that infraction. We exchanged texts, and she still won't say she's sorry or explain why she made me so angry. When IT reaches an all-time low, I tell my co-workers that I've identified the AP and that they and his friends probably shouldn't contact me online anymore. The only time I get a response from her is when I ask, who have you been talking to? She says nothing about the situation. Despite this, hope remains. I'm here to tell you that I've made it, despite this person I cared about very much at one point in my life trying to invoke wrath and scorn to the limits of human tolerance. I'm not just still here because I'm a tough cookie, but I'm better off for it. The most obvious fact is that you, the Redditor, are probably just as sick and disgusted by this woman as I am. People with such a lack of decency should not be allowed to live, let alone reproduce. Ultimately, this trip became about so much more than that, catapulting me to a new level of development for which I am profoundly grateful. During my first sessions of therapy, I realized that I have a tendency to want to fix things. My family always treated me poorly, and my spouse is the perfect fit for the empty space in my life left by my upbringing. All of her incessant demands and hoop jumping became familiar and comforting. I was never who I claimed to be in my relationships with her because I was constantly adapting to be the person I thought would bring her the most joy. That plan obviously didn't work, and it paved the way for the failure I now see laid out before me. One of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is to separate my ex from my own sense of worth. This was necessary because I was giving love without ever caring about receiving it in return. Someone else's recent post helped me realize that my long and deep love for her had led me to derive some of my sense of value from our relationship. When that was severed, 
I felt like I lost some of my worth without even realizing it. It made me feel like I had to prove myself to my ex or that my value increased while I was with her. What an awfully tragic statement, the meaning of which eluded me until very recently. Because I lacked self-awareness, I was never able to accept and embrace my own preferences. I was never taught to take pride in both my successes and my failures. Since I'm late to the party, I've spent my life trying to please other people and have therefore neglected to discover my true worth. My natural gregariousness and sense of humor never stemmed from a genuine place. The red flags in others have been raised for me, and I now know what I can offer and what I want from this world. I've learned so much about myself and the world in the past year. I've also come to realize who my true friends and family are and how much I cherish them. I've recently become acquainted with a lovely lady who places value on the right things. Our love is completely mutual, she takes pride in my successes and helps me bear the weight of our challenges. She shows compassion and kindness to those around her, including me, because she is firmly committed to living by these principles. I count myself incredibly lucky to have met and be continuing life's journey with this bright, young, and fiery woman. In honor of my 40th birthday, my friends and I have purchased a camper van and will be driving across the country. It's more than I could have hoped for, with layers of complexity I never even dreamed of in my previous relationship. I could write a mini novel about all the small, lovely things she has done for me. My company has taken off in the past year, and I no longer have to hide my decisions from my business partner out of fear of their disapproval. I have control over my time and can devote as much energy as I want to my work or take a break and let my staff deal with the day-to-day -day operations. I thought I was in a happy marriage a few years ago, but now I see how wrong I was. It's been 30 years since I've had a birthday to celebrate and I intend to make the most of it this year. Even though it seems minor now that I've put it in writing, coming to terms with who I am and being happy with that has been a huge step forward for me. If you've made it this far, May God reward your compassion, your interest, and the support you've shown me by reading everything I've written. I have no idea if anyone will find any benefit from this post, but writing it was therapeutic for me as I worked through the trauma of having trusted a human monster and then having that trust betray me. TL, doctor this is a rant, man. Oh, right, here we go into detail. My high school sweetheart and my wife of 10 years had an epic affair for an entire year without my knowledge. I was hospitalized with pneumonia and nearly lost my life before Dee Dee struck a month later. She continued the betrayal by stabbing me in the back at every available opportunity, from trying to conceal the fact that she sold our home to illegally dropping me from our health insurance plan and then using the proceeds to settle her back taxes with the Internal Revenue Service two years later. Without being bound to this demon, I am in a much better place, and in the last two years, I have grown as a person more than at any other time in my life. In addition, I have met the love of my life, and the two of us are about to set out on a wonderful journey together.